Hello friends, welcome to One Academy. Let's crack neat PG. I'm Dr. Shanali Chandra and in today's session we will be discussing clinical management of IUGR pregnancy in detail. I've highlighted my referral code here which is S-H-O-N-A-L-I. So if you take a non-academy subscription you can avail a 10% discount friends, on using this subscription code. You can also download now the Unacademy Learning app. You can get yourself notified about the upcoming sessions on the platform so that will help you make uh, your journey easier. On the Plus platform, guys, you'll get daily live classes where you can chat with your educator, you know, interact, ask your doubts and queries and get them solved there and then. So it's like a live classroom experience. The courses are structured, keeping in line with the latest NEET PG syllabus. There are also live tests and quizzes which will help you evaluate your performance as you go along. And most importantly, one-time subscription gives you an unlimited access so you can watch all the live sessions from all the faculties who are active on the platform and even if you miss out on the live sessions you can always go back and watch the recorded versions from the comfort of your own devices top educators are associated with the platform all subjects that we need to prepare for our postgrad entrance examinations they are covered and every now and then comprehensive batch courses as well as short duration uh, crash courses they keep getting launched so you can check out the ongoing courses in the platform as well and now there is a new module of subscription which is the iconic subscription Subscription, which allows you to access an academy and prep ladder at the same time. You can take this subscription for 12, 18, 24 or 36 months duration and if you subscribe using my code that is S-H-O-N-A-L-I then you can avail a 10% discount on your subscription package as well. And talking about the NEAT PG Plus subscription, well again there are various modules of subscription packages. You can choose one depending on your needs and requirements. So if you're targeting the upcoming exam and want a shorter duration crash course then you can take the one month or three month duration subscription and if you're targeting for example the next exams then you can take the 12 month duration subscription uh, it will allow you ample time to go through all of the live sessions and will leave you enough time in the end to revise as well and it turns out to be more economical in the longer run as well and for those of you who want a slower pace of preparation like for example you're in your third year or final year MBBS or you're concurrently working at the same time so you're juggling hospital schedules clinics and classes and duties all together then you can take the 24 months duration subscription it turns out to be far more economical in the longer run and if you subscribe using my code that is s-h-o-n-a-l-i then you can avail another 10 percent discount on your subscription package you can also check out the previous special classes. These special classes are free uh, on the Unacademy platform. And once you subscribe to the platform, you can access the various capsule courses as well. So there's a capsule course on reproductive gynecology, on high-risk pregnancy, on gynae oncology, as well as on labor and its complications. Now, coming back to the session at hand for today, clinical management of intrauterine growth retarded pregnancy. So good evening, Richa. I can see that you have joined in and I welcome everybody else who's watching me on this platform. Now, in this session today, we're going to first clear the basic understanding of what fetal growth restriction is all about. What are the risk factors? How is it identified? How is it diagnosed? And how is it followed up right so we're going to talk about the IUGR pregnancy step-by-step -step format so let's get started let's first establish what fetal growth is determined by now fetal growth the growth of the fetus is determined by various factors the three predominant factors are the maternal provision of substrate, you know, it is the mother who is meeting the oxygen requirement of the fetus, the mother who is meeting the glucose, amino acid, lipid, fats, calcium, iron, everything that the baby needs to grow, it is being provided by the mother itself. So maternal provision of substrate determines the fetal growth. Secondly, all those substrates, you know, all those substances, they need to be transported to the fetus by way of the placenta. So placental transport of uh, substrate should be adequate. So the placenta should be well oxygenated, should be functioning well, right? And apart from that, yes, every fetus genomically has its own growth potential as well. So these three broad factors are determining the fetal growth. Now, moving on further, if you see 
what are the risk factors for fetal growth restriction and the risk factors are an intermingling of factors that are maternal in origin right factors that are fetal in origin and factors that are operating at the level of the placenta right now let's get going on this let's get going on the risk factors for fetal growth restriction or under what circumstances can fetal growth restriction take place now at the level of the mother if there is you know poor uh, gestational weight gain during pregnancy a mother is not eating well for whatever reason that could be but poor maternal weight gain right poor nutrition of the mother now this poor nutrition need not be at the time of gestation itself but a, a neutrally a nutritionally deprived female who's went on to become pregnant right so poor nutrition would be right from the childhood to adolescence to you know getting pregnant and reaching the reproductive age group so poor nutrition throughout social deprivation also contributes to again these are going to further contribute to the maternal provision of the stores to the fetus right apart from that there can be fetal malformations and the fetus is suffering from a gross congenital anomaly malformed fetus will not be able to grow well so that is the fetal factor another factor could be the maternal intake of a drugs right she is on certain drugs which are teratogenic potential they can get transferred to the fetus from the mother's side by way of placenta and therefore lead to fetal growth restriction there could be um, maternal fetal infections right so there can be infections like rubella toxoplasmosis cytomegalovirus all of these infections which can undergo vertical transmission from the mother to the fetus and therefore lead to fetal growth restriction there can also be utero placental insufficiency the placenta is the connecting link between the mother and the fetus and that placenta has not formed well right so the placenta is not perfused well from the mother side so that is utero placental insufficiency leading to decreased blood supply to the placenta right now there can be various genetic abnormalities like chromosomal aneuploidies which are going to affect the fetus directly as well altering the fetus's growth potential and these genetic abnormalities can also interfere with the development of the placenta and contribute to utero placental insufficiency as well you can have a multi fetal uh, pregnancies right so twin pregnancies triplet pregnancies where there is fetal overcrowding inside the uterine cavity or there could be a placenta which is shared between the two fetuses contributing to utero placental insufficiency in the fetuses so that could also be responsible for fetal growth restriction and if of course there can be a number of uh, maternal medical conditions you know which can affect the utero placental uh, blood supply and therefore or contribute to a uh, fetal growth restriction like for example if a mother has uh, you know if i talk about specific conditions uh, which are identified here so there can be a uh, chronic asthma there can be a uh, cyanotic uh, congenital heart disease in the mother which makes the mother's blood only less oxygenated so therefore the fetus's blood is also less oxygenated so that could be a reason right other than that there can be various factors contributing to utero placental insufficiency particularly they affect the development of the placenta like for example uh, maternal uh, hypertension uh, maternal preeclampsia eclampsia right for example antiphospholipid antibody uh, syndrome right uh, when there is an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome there is thrombosis at the level of uh, spiral arterioles now these are the spiral arterioles which are taking the blood from the maternal side right that is from the uterine lining here to the intervillous spaces of the placenta so apla if there is a thrombosis in the spiral arterioles if the spiral arterioles are constricted narrowed like that seen in hypertension and preeclampsia if there is a diabetic vasculopathy if there is a diabetic vasculopathy right so diabetes per se maternal diabetes per se leads to fetal overgrowth but yes if there is a diabetic vasculopathy pre existent that has the potential of causing utero placenta insufficiency and do not forget maternal smoking as well so mothers who tend to smoke during pregnancy you know their uh, placental barrier is much more thickened and that is how they contribute to utero placental insufficiency there so these are all your risk factors for fetal growth restriction so these are the circumstances under which you can find or identify a growth restricted fetus right now moving on further let's 
also establish certain other pointers in mind before we come on to the diagnosis. Now we have a term which is called as low birth weight and we have a term which is called as small for gestational age. Now what is the difference between the two? When you say low birth weight, it means that birth weight is less than 2500 grams irrespective of the gestational age, right? And when I say small for gestational age, that means that the weight of the fetus at that particular gestational age is less than 10th percentile for that gestational age. Right? So these are the two terms which you need to differentiate when you talk about intrauterine growth restricted fetuses. What I'm talking about when I'm saying IUGR is these ones, small for gestational age. Let's elaborate them on, uh, on these terms a little bit. So these are your growth charts. Right. If you remember, you must have seen these same growth charts when you study pediatrics for that matter or when you track the growth of the child after being born right? Similar growth charts exists for estimated fetal weight in grams. That means the gestational age weight in utero fetal weight and the gestational age in weeks. So we realize that if you look at the red colored line here, which is showing the 50th centile, which is showing the 50th centile here, right? And we have other lines also tracking going parallel along with the 50th centile. So you have the 90th centile and the 10th centile and the 99th and the first centile there, right? So you have these curves, these are the growth charts. So fetus is expected to weigh something at 15 weeks, expected to weigh something at 20 weeks, expected to weigh something at 25 weeks, at 30 weeks, at 35 weeks, and so on. Like suppose if there is a fetus who delivered at 40 weeks, okay, let's say a fetus delivered at 40 weeks, but the birth weight was 2100 grams right and let's say a fetus was born at 32 weeks here at 32 weeks here and the birth weight was 2 grams 2000 grams okay so both of these fetuses the one born at 40 weeks the one born at 32 weeks both of them are low birth weight both of them are low birth weight now which one is growth restricted which one is growth restricted will depend upon how the growth has been in utero. So growth has to be tracked over a period of time. Let's say, for example, this fetus at 30 weeks weight is here. I saw that fetus again at 35 weeks weight is here. So the growth is fine. The growth is fine. But I see a fetus at 30 weeks here and the weight at 34 weeks is 35 weeks is here. So there is a lag of growth, right? So whenever there is a lag of growth, that is growth restriction, right? And how much should be that lag? That should be below this blue dotted line here, 10th centile. Anything that is less than 10th centile. Like for example, there could be a fetus who at 32 weeks weight is here and at 35 weeks weight is here. So the axis of growth is fine. The baby is growing. That's okay. At 38 weeks, let's say it's here. So it is not on the 50th centile, not on the 50th centile, but less than that. But even then, the slope of growth is continuing and there, right? But it is never falling below the 10th centile. So that won't be growth restriction right? So small for gestational age would be when your expected weight at that particular gestation is less than the 10th centile. And not just that, not just that, you have to see it over a period of time. So over a period of time, if you see that the fetus is growing, that's okay. But over a time, if you realize when you saw the fetus at 30 weeks here, Let's say you saw the fetus as 30 weeks, 30 weeks here. That was the expect that was the estimated fetal weight. You saw again at 35 weeks here. So look at this. Now the slope is declining, the slope is falling down. 
So that slope of growth is extremely, extremely important in figuring, figuring out whether it is a pathologically growth restricted fetus or a constitutionally small fetus. So we have two types of small for gestational age as well. We have, we call somebody who's constitutionally small, right? So you can see uh, five year olds or 10 year olds uh, children for that matter. And not every 10 year old will be the same build. They can have varying uh, height they can have varying uh, weights right but both or all of those 10 year olds might be absolutely normal and healthy you see them after a couple of months they are all growing well right so the rate of growth is what is very very important to note so we call it as constitutionally small or there could be frank pathological growth restriction right so there are two types of small for gestational age small for gestational age which are constitutionally small and pathologically growth restricted how do you differentiate not just by one go we have to track their growth over a period of time so those who are constitutionally small will maintain their rate of growth they will be on the lower centiles, but they will maintain their rate of growth and blood flow to that fetus will not be compromised, right? There will be no evidence of utroplacental insufficiency. Whereas pathologically growth restricted fetuses, on the other hand, their rate of growth is slowed down over a period of time and you can identify features of utroplacental insufficiency in those pathologically growth restricted fetuses. So being constitutionally small is okay but being pathologically growth restricted is not because a baby is trying to grow under this uh, you know unfavorable uterine environment where he's not getting enough nutrients and resources from the placenta from the mother's side and therefore its rate of growth is slowed and say so say there is there is no staging of iugr and like there's no mild moderate severe that is defined okay but yes lesser the la i mean more the lag of growth right it has been seen that uh, the less than 10th centile is when you define a small for gestational age as it becomes less and less than this less than fifth centile less than third centile if your weight is less than third centile of the expected weight then it is considered as a poor outcome okay so that would be what is more important to note how far down below the expected weight that fetus is. Now, moving on further, let us also elaborate on a very, very important conceptual understanding of the various types of growth restricted fetuses that you can find. And you must have heard about asymmetrical IUGR and symmetrical IUGR right now how is how is it different how are they two different so when a fetus is very very small you see here in initial development in initial development there is more of build up of fetal tissue you know so this hyperplasia cellular hyperplasia which is taking place in the first 16 weeks of fetal growth and thereafter that as the fetus progresses beyond 16 weeks of gestation up to 32 weeks of gestation there is hyperplasia as well as hypertrophy so cellular multiplication as well as individual cell size also grows so there's hyperplasia and hypertrophy in the uh, up to 32 weeks of gestation and beyond that there is mainly predominantly hypertrophy which occurs as a component of fetal growth where fetal fat and glycogen is getting accumulated in the fetus's body. So this is the pattern of fetal growth that is there. Now if you understand this simple concept you'll realize here that if there is an early global insult to the fetus let's say for example there is a factor which operated early on in gestation like for example there could be fetal infection there could be fetal structural anomalies there could be aneuploidies. So if there is an early fetal global insult that is 
is going to affect the hyperplasia of the fetus cellular hyperplasia so cellular number will decrease so the cell number is decreased and the baby is proportionately small so there is decrease in both head size as well as the body size of the baby right whereas if there is a late insult whereas if there is a late insult to the fetus like for example all these utero placental insufficiencies the consequences of utero placental insufficiencies they start operating beyond 32 weeks of gestation so if there is a utero placental insufficiency it is regarded as a late insult and after that what will happen it will interfere with the glucose transport it will interfere with the glucose transport to the fetus and therefore since that is the time when hypertrophy of tissues is taking place the cell number does not decrease right the cell number does not decrease but what happens is that the cell size decreases the cell size decreases so the size of the head is otherwise normal but your abdomen size of the baby decreases right now Oswan you're asking me what is the cause of constitutional growth it is just that that baby is constitutionally small every every individual has their growth potential right that growth potential is realized over a period of time that is genetically determined right so there are um, if let's say for example you can apply the same analogy because it's much more easier to see it after birth you see right so there are people who are all 20 year olds one 20 year old is five feet tall other 20 eight years old is uh, five feet six inches somebody six feet tall now that doesn't mean that these three are necessary but that is their constitution that is how the genetic makeup is right so apply that same analogy to the fetal life also so there's no cause for it is something that is just there constitutionally that fetus is a uh, small in size Okay. <clears throat> Now, once you understand this concept here, you will be ready to figure out the differences between the symmetrical IUGR versus asymmetrical IUGR. So, which of the two is more common? The asymmetrical IUGR is what we find in clinical practice more commonly. About 80% of growth restricted fetuses are actually because of AS are asymmetrical growth, asymmetrically growth restricted, right? Uh, in symmetrical IUGR, I told you the fetus is going to be proportionately small right and asymmetrical IUGR the head is going to be larger than the abdomen the causes of symmetrical IUGR is going to be an early insult to the fetus which is taking place early on in gestation like genetic or chromosomal causes or fetal infections and asymmetrical IUGR the cause is going to be chronic utero placental insufficiency which is going to contribute this chronic utero placental insufficiency can happen because of various underlying medical conditions of the mother or could be because of gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, APLA, diabetic vasculopathy, right? And in symmetrical IUGR, the total number of cells is reduced, whereas in asymmetrical IUGR, the cell number remains fine or normal, but it is the cell size which is smaller right so when i say that the fetus is proportionately small that means the head circumference everything decreases the head circumference the biparietal diameter the femur length of the fetus the abdomen circumference all parameters decrease in proportion so your ratios which is head circumference by abdominal circumference ratio or femur length by abdominal circumference ratio all these ratios they become mean normal right whereas in asymmetrical IUGR since the head is larger since the head is larger than the abdomen and it is the abdomen which is shrunken in size you see the abdominal circumference decreases much much more as compared to the other parameters so if you compare the head circumference 
to the abdominal circumference ratio or if you can uh, compare the femur length to abdominal circumference ratio these ratios are increased in case is of asymmetrical iugr now this is an important classification to remember direct mcqs in your exams are asked from these basic differences between asymmetrical versus symmetrical iugr fetuses right now once we are clear with this let's talk about the neonatal course now the neonatal course or after delivery who are going to fare better or who are going to fare worse so after delivery the neonatal course is worse in cases of symmetrical iugr because of the underlying causes you see under like whatever genetic cause that will stay with the fetus whatever chromosomal abnormality that will stay with the fetus the infection will stay with the fetus so because of the underlying causes neonatal course is worse in cases of symmetrical iugr whereas asymmetrical iugr they have a better prognosis after being born i mean they are going to catch up their growth they are going to catch up their growth after being born now moving on further let's talk about the more common type of uh, iugr that is your asymmetrical iugr that resulted because of chronic utero placental insufficiency this is the diagram this is the picture of an iugr fetus after being born right so what has happened with chronic utero placental insufficiency now understand that fetus is a very very intelligent being okay now inside the uterus when the fetus is in a stressful situation he has limited resources now fetus knows how to use those limited resources very wisely right so the fetus is going to redistribute the blood flow between various organs so the fetus knows that i'm getting a lesser supply of blood or i'm getting a lesser supply of nutrients or i'm getting a lesser supply of oxygen so let me preferentially give this blood to the more important organs like the heart and the brain predominantly the brain there right so more blood goes to the heart and the brain and this is what we call as brain sparing and this is what we also see that the head is the head is larger the head circumference or the size of the head is well maintained right on the other hand the fetus is, is going to give less blood to the kidneys okay so fetus preferentially gives more blood to the heart and brain and consequently less blood goes to the fetal kidneys now fetal kidneys also produce fetal urine and fetal urine is a major component of the amniotic fluid volume after 18 weeks of gestation so when less blood goes to the fetal kidneys there is less urine formation by the fetal kidneys so there's fetal oliguria and that results in oligohydroamnios so you have a growth restricted baby with the finding of oligohydroamnios now oligohydroamnios in this setting has not developed overnight right it has taken chronic utero placental insufficiency insufficiency to result in oligohydroamnios on the other hand yes of course you see the fetus is, has limited resources right so in the last part of pregnancy beyond 32 weeks much of the fetuses uh, fat deposits and your glycogen deposits of the fetus were to form right now they are not forming instead the fetus is using up all its liver glycogen stores to meet its deficiency of glucose so the fetal stores of glycogen which are stored in the fetal liver they are depleted and that results in a decreased liver span of the fetus liver is here liver is here so the fetus's liver span decreases and that contributes to the declining abdominal circumference that leads to decrease in abdominal circumference of the fetus so you get a fetus characteristically like this the head larger the head circumference biparietal diameter they are fine but your abdominal circumference is less that is what you get when there is chronic utero placental insufficiency 
right? That is what you get when there is an asymmetrical IUGR, which is happening most of the times because of a chronic utero-placental insufficiency, whatever may be the underlying cause of this utero-placental insufficiency. Right now, now that we are clear with this, let's take up a case scenario. Let's talk about a 25 year old primary gravida who came for her routine ANC checkup at eight months of gestation. Okay, so you did a per abdominal examination and you found that the fundal height is only 28 weeks right 28 weeks somewhere around seven month right her bp is normal you check that instantly right her uh, height is five feet tall she's not too short height but she's fine as far as indian standards are concerned and her weight is also okay according to her height 50 kg weight so it's not like she mother is having some socioeconomic deprivation or she is having a low weight gain or it's not like there is a maternal poor nutrition so you're identifying that as well so that's not there what are the possible causes what are the possible causes now i want you to think apart from iugr since the discussion is on IUGR, yes, of course, a woman who is at eight month gestation, but the fundal height is less than the period of gestation. One of the causes that you are definitely considering is a growth restricted, a smaller baby inside. But what else could be the causes right now? Yes, what else could be the causes and what is the most important thing that you're going to do next? They have given you eight months gestation. Now she's saying I'm eight months pregnant. Now how many weeks pregnant is she? It is very, very important to note whether she remembers her dates correctly. It could be simple miscalculation of dates as well. So you have to keep that possibility in mind that she simply could have wrong dates. And Peter is also saying it could be a malpresentation. Very good. It could be a malpresentation. It could be a transfer slide. That information is not given in the question, right? Or it could be a dead baby. A dead baby, right? It could be a dead baby. Oligohydroemnios by itself. Maybe she has had a complaint of leaking which she has not told you or which you've not bothered to ask. Maybe all the liquor has leaked out. And that has resulted in oligohydroemnios and that is why her fundal height is less than expected, right? And then, of course, you can consider IUGR and I'll add another to the list, malpresentations like transverse lie. These could be the possible causes. So whenever you find that the fundal height is less than the period of gestation, you do suspect IUGR, but also rule out the other important causes as well. So reconfirm the LMP and period of gestation. Ask her about fetal movements. Auscultate the fetal heart rate. I mean, auscultate the fetal heart rate. This information was not given in the question. So, auscultate the fetal heart rate. Ask her about the fetal movements. Ask her about any history of leaking per vagina, right? And once you have confirmed the LMP, once you've ensured that the fetus is alive, once you've asked that there is no history of leaking PV, what's the next investigation that you do? What is the next investigation that you do, which is going to uh, find out the exact cause? The next investigation is going to be a simple ultrasound, isn't it? Let's do an ultrasound let's do an ultrasound that was going to be your next investigation ultrasound will help me see the amount of lichen inside ultrasound will let me confirm whether the fetal heart rate is there or not confirm that also ultrasound would also give me some parameters to work the period of gestation isn't it so there's so much information i gain by doing this ultrasound so let's say the gestational age is 32 weeks. You confirmed and counted and calculated. Gestational age is 32 weeks. Fundal height is 28 weeks. And that's your ultrasound report. The report said that the measurement of the biparietal diameter con uh, you know, contributes uh, to about um, 31 weeks. Uh, height circumference is about 
28 weeks femur length is about 32 weeks abdominal circumference is about 28 weeks amniotic fluid is decreased and your estimated fetal weight at 32 weeks is only 1000 grams so your doppler is also normal so what is your diagnosis now what is your diagnosis? What has happened here? In just one ultrasound report, you can say, look at the abdominal circumference and look at all the other parameters. Look at the femur length and look at the biparietal diameter. Femur length is corresponding well to the period of gestation, but your abdominal circumference is lagging behind by four weeks. That's a significant lag right so your abdominal circumference is lagging behind your amniotic fluid volume is also decreased your estimated fetal weight you'll have to plot it on the graph where it is by usually at 32 weeks the weight should be around 1200 to 1500 grams so this is less than expected so what is your diagnosis now your diagnosis is confirmed now this is IUGR this is small for gestational age small for gestational age with IUGR pathological growth restriction because of the lag that you can see had it been constitutionally small had it been constitutionally small all parameters would corroborate with each other all parameters would actually corroborate with each other isn't it and this is not birth weight Simran this is ultrasound report estimated fetal weight okay birth weight is low birth weight is after birth when you measure after birth this we are tracking the ultrasound report so as of now at 32 weeks gestation her abdominal circumference is lagging behind with the as compared to the femur length and the biparietal diameter amniotic fluid is decreased the estimated fetal weight is also on the lower side if you see such a report you will suspect small for gestational age and IUGR clear on this okay now let's have a look at this question if they ask you this mcq and they've asked this a multiple number of times what is the single best parameter for the diagnosis of iugr ac bpd fl hc when you have to diagnose IUGR, I, talk, I took you through what happens with chronic placental insufficiency and I told you what parameters get affected the most, what parameter decreases. So if you have to rely on a single best parameter for diagnosis of IUGR, it would be which parameter? Yes, guys, it would be which parameter? It would be abdominal circumference. Peter answering very correctly abdominal circumference right so when there is fetal growth restriction of the asymmetrical type all right your different parameters are decreased differently right so I told you that your head circumferences your biparietal diameters they are okay they don't decrease that much right your femur length length of the baby's femur does not decreases that much what is affected is your abdominal circumference because of this chronic placental efficiency the fetal glycogen deposits they are stores are depleted and the liver span of the fetus decreases that contributes to decrease in abdominal circumference that's your single best parameter for the diagnosis of IUGR if you consider each of these parameters separately okay now moving on further let's have a look at another case let's say if the gestational age is 32 weeks and your fundal height is 30 weeks okay so fundal height is slightly less as compared to the expected gestational age your ultrasound report shows a bpd of 30 weeks a head circumference of 29 weeks a femur length of 30 weeks abdominal circumference of 29 weeks amniotic fluid normal at that point in time what is happening here what is happening here estimated fetal weight of 1300 grams what could be happening here and what do you do next so of course there could be wrong dates of course maybe you could have have wrong dates but let's say you have checked you first consider wrong dates then you checked and you confirmed the dates you checked and you confirmed the dates the dates are fine your calculation of gestational age 32 weeks also fine 
but the baby is smaller in all parameters so peter i told you possibly wrong dates we confirm the dates they are fine all parameters are near or near or less corroborating with each other if you consider abdominal circumference and you compare it with biparietal diameter and fetal uh, femur length there's only one week discrepancy that discrepancy is not significant enough moreover the amniotic fluid is also normal the estimated fetal weight is slightly on the lower side but not too low also what do i do next i want to know what do i do next yes so it could possibly be a constitutional growth restriction but how do i find out peter i agree with you this could be a constitutionally small fetus how do i find out how do i find out how do i find out everything is ultrasound is normal if it's a constitutionally small fetus it would keep growing at the expected pace right it would keep growing at the expected pace so it is a small for gestational age fetus i have to see whether it is constitutionally or smaller pathologically growth restricted i will have to repeat the scan yes i will have to repeat the scan after 3 to 4 weeks not before 3 weeks not before 3 weeks repeat after 3 to 4 weeks let's say i repeated after 3 weeks and this is the report that came let's say i repeated after 3 weeks and this is the report bpd 33 head circumference 32 femur length 33 ac 32 weeks amniotic fluid is still normal estimated fetal weight has also increased so what have i found out on repeat scan i have figured that 3 weeks worth of growth and gain in weight took place so now this is likely what this is your constitutional this is your constitutionally small fetus likely constitutionally small fetus as long as the growth keeps happening okay so once i have picked up fetal growth restriction on clinical examination the next step has to be keep tracking the growth if the growth is maintaining its uh, upward slope everything is fine but if the slope of growth is declining then that's a pathologically growth restricted fetus which i told you in the very offset that i appreciate i wanted you to appreciate this very very important information that it is the slope of growth which needs to be maintained in the forward upward direction okay and if your growth is like this the slope of growth is declining then that is a pathologically growth restricted fetus now moving on further let's talk about the utility of fetal doppler okay now what does this fetal doppler do and how is it helpful in evaluating growth restricted babies all right because one of the most important aspects of monitoring growth restricted babies is to ensure that their blood flows are normal as long as their blood flows are normal i'm okay right okay simran you are asking it will be symmetrical iugr no if it is maintaining its forward growth if it is if if it keeps on growing like this right i did a scan after 3 weeks it is maintaining its growth i repeated another scan after 4 weeks it's still maintaining its upward growth then it is not symmetrical iugr it's not iugr then it's a constitutionally small fetus as long as the growth slope of growth is maintained as long as there is no evidence of utroplacental insufficiency where is the evidence of utroplacental insufficiency here the amniotic fluid is maintaining itself in the normal range so it is not symmetrical iugr okay symmetrical iugr would be when over a period of time the weight of the fetus is not increasing or it is lagging behind and all parameters are decreased proportionally right but that lag of growth should be there over a period of 3 to 4 weeks all right simran are we clear on this okay now 
coming to the utility of fetal doppler fetal doppler is the gold standard for evaluation of an iugr fetus once you've made the diagnosis that yes this is a pathologically growth restricted fetus further evaluation would be fetal doppler it is also used for the timing of delivery and thirdly it determines the obstetric outcome i'll talk about all this elaborate on these one by one let's first of all establish the principle of fetal doppler all right now what are we seeing in doppler we are seeing the blood flows to the fetus which blood flows are we seeing umbilical artery blood flows predominantly to begin with so this is a diagram of the fetal circulation which i have uh, shown in front of you here and you can see here that this is your placenta this is your placenta okay and you can see here uh, these ones here these are your umbilical arteries two umbilical arteries which are taking blood deoxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta to got oxygenated and we have your umbilical vein here which is carrying oxygenated blood back to the fetus and it joins the put uh, it joins the ductus venosus here it becomes the ductus venosus here okay when it joins with the portal vein when it joins with the portal vein umbilical vein joins with the portal vein to become ductus venosus in this segment here and this ductus venosus opens into the inferior vena cava oxygenated blood goes to the right atrium from the right atrium blood goes via foramen ovale into the left side of the heart right and from the left side of the heart it goes via aorta and supplies the blood supply to the fetus okay so this is your fetal circulation and simran yes doppler is the colorful ultrasound which helps you to see the blood flows into the various blood vessels now we have to see and understand what will happen when there is utero placental insufficiency whenever there is going to be the spiral arterioles which are narrow see placenta is these are the uh, fetal vessels there is going to be the intervillous spaces they are going to be intervillous spaces and these intervillous spaces are going to get perfused by spiral arterioles right which are putting maternal blood into the intervillous spaces now when the spiral arterioles become narrow constricted thrombosed for whichever reason right then the resistance of blood flow at the level of placenta is increased placenta is giving too much resistance for forward flow of blood to take place in the umbilical arteries so these are all connected these are all connected okay so when your 60 to 70% of placental circulation is compromised 60 to 70% of placental circulation coming from the maternal side by way of spiral arterioles when 60 to 70% of maternal circulation coming from the spiral arterioles by way of the maternal side is compromised is not taking part in placental exchange of gases and nutrients that is when the fetal doppler starts becoming abnormal and the first changes are seen in the umbilical artery doppler so umbilical arteries are taking blood to the placenta are taking blood to the placenta if there is a lot of resistance at the placenta the umbilical arteries will not be pushing able to take blood forward to the placenta so your first changes are seen in the umbilical artery doppler my goal is to identify it here not when your preterminal changes impending death or myocardial ischemia sets in because what will happen a time will come you see a baby is going to keep surviving keep surviving in this hostile environment of decreased utero placental blood flows or supplies by just making do okay he is going to fight his way through through the 9 months of pregnancy as far as he can go pushing pushing blood flow pushing blood through the umbilical arteries to get oxygenated against this placental resistance a time will come when the fetus will just give up
when that time comes when there is so much resistance at the level of placenta that no amount of fetal effort can push blood forward through the umbilical arteries what will happen there will be myocardial ischemia fetus is getting hypoxic now fetus is getting less less and less of oxygen and nutrients fetus is fighting okay a time will come when the oxygen supply or nutrients are so less that there is myocardial ischemia that has set in so now the fetus's heart cannot pump blood forward at all it was the heart which was pumping blood forward now the heart cannot pump blood uh, pump blood forward and then back pressure changes in these vessels will be seen your ductus venosus your umbilical veins then your doppler will become abnormal in the ductus venosus and umbilical veins as well and when that happens they are pre terminal changes that means there is impending these are signs of impending death like reversal of flow in ductus venosus ulta opposite opposite direction of flow in the ductus venosus it should go upwards towards the heart but it is reversed reversal of flow in ductus venosus or there are pulsations which are seen in the umbilical venous circulation or these are bad signs i don't want these bad signs to come i want to diagnose when the umbilical artery doppler changes are there so what are these umbilical artery doppler changes that i'm going to look at another time like let's say let me re, uh, let me mention them again umbilical artery here this is the umbilical vein so as the placental resistance increases there is going to be a problem right umbilical artery has to take blood to the placenta right so there has to be forward flow so there is a forward flow in umbilical artery always right towards the placenta so that deoxygenated blood can reach the placenta and get oxygenated now this forward flow in the umbilical artery has two phases the blood flow during systole and the blood flow during diastole so this is your systolic blood flow and that's your diastolic blood flow right s and d systolic blood flow forward flow in the heart tree uh that is when your heart is pumping blood fetal heart is pumping forward blood through the umbilical artery and a diastolic flow which is also there that is when the heart is relaxed still when the heart is relaxed blood flow is always in the forward direction towards the placenta so forward flow in umbilical artery towards the placenta is always there and as pregnancy advances normally more and more blood flows through the umbilical artery because to meet the increasing requirements of the fetus so the diastolic flow in the umbilical artery also increases okay as pregnancy advances in normal circumstances in normal circumstances that should happen what will happen if the placental resistance increases if there is an increased resistance to placental blood to blood flow at the level of the placenta then there will be a decrease in flow during diastole that means in systole the fetus's heart is able to pump blood forward but in diastole when the fetus's heart is relaxed and not pumping the forward flow in the diastole decreases so it will be like this systolic flow will be maintained but your diastolic flow in umbilical artery will decrease and that is what we track when we do umbilical artery doppler we check the blood flow in the umbilical artery during systole we check the blood flow during diastole and we assess whether or not there is a decrease in diastolic flow if a decrease in diastolic flow is happening that means the placental resistance is increasing that means fetus ko dikkat ho rahi hai that the fetus is having a hard time pumping blood forward but the fetus will manage somehow fetal will fetus will still manage still fight a time might come that the placental resistance increases so much that fetus is able to pump blood forward during diastole but du uh, during systole but at diastole 
forward resistance is so much so it's so constricted out there in front that absolutely no blood flow takes place in the forward direction during diastole so in the systole the heart manages to pump blood forward systolic and in the diastole can you see here diastole there is flow forward no flow absent this is what we call as absent end diastolic flow absent end diastolic flow okay now simran i'll get back to your question this is the sequence of events that happen this is the sequence of events that happen that initially it will be the diastolic flow that will decrease later a time might come when there is absent end diastolic flow and with further compromising of the placental circulation with further increase in resistance heart is still able to pump blood during systole systolic flow is there but during diastole on the other hand what is happening when the heart is relaxed fetus is heart pumping blood going forward in umbilical artery that's okay fetus is heart relaxed blood is flowing in the opposite direction reverse because there is so much of resistance at the level of the placenta this is what we call as reversed end diastolic flow reversed end diastolic flow now these are very very bad absent end diastolic flow reversed end diastolic flow these are bad findings these are not preterminal these are not impending deaths but yes of course it gives us an idea that the fetus is have the fetus's heart is having a hard time at any point in time now fetal heart failure could set in and if fetal heart failure starts to set in i'll get the preterminal changes right like you are asking simran what if there is decrease in systolic blood flow there is a there is going to be a decrease in systolic blood flow forward blood flow i think when the uh, i think when the heart is not able to pump even during systole that is there is heart pump failure okay then i no longer talk about uh, decrease in systolic blood flow but what is visualized is the back pressure changes which i elaborated in the first slide okay so these are your umbilical artery doppler changes why am i looking for them i'm looking for them to time delivery now let's go back to our case let's go back to our case here the first case of the day where the gestational height was 32 weeks your fundal height was 28 weeks you had done an ultrasound an ultrasound you had found that there was a significant lag of 4 weeks you had a lag of 4 weeks you had found the amniotic fluid was decreased you had found the estimated fetal weight was less and initially you had found that right now the doppler was normal now my question to you is she is right now 32 weeks with iugr with features of chronic utero placental insufficiency also there in front of you amniotic fluid is decreased but right now the doppler is normal the baby is pre term how do you manage what are you going to do are you going to deliver right now or are you going to give it some time so that pulmonary maturity can be achieved and how long can you wait before delivering the baby because the more the baby stays inside the more growth accrues right so you don't want to deliver a preterm baby preterm plus iugr will be like a double edged sword on the baby growth restricted also preterm also too bad right so the management of iugr pregnancy is all about monitoring the growth of the baby monitoring the fetus whether it is doing well or not i want to intervene when doppler suggests that it is becoming too much for the baby to survive inside it is becoming a very hostile environment it will be reflected on umbilical artery doppler now i don't want to wait for the impending death wala changes to come and then act because that would mean that i am delivering a heart failure baby no i want to intervene much sooner so i want to depend upon the umbilical artery doppler findings i want to pick up the abnormal findings earlier before it progresses to a level where there can be 
intra uterine death of the baby or where there can be such severe myocardial ischemia that the fetus is i deliver a hypoxic baby now what will i get i don't want that so this has to be a balance between allowing for growth by way of monitoring and the moment i realize that it is becoming too hostile environment for the baby to remain inside i'll deliver the baby so the management is all about resting rest in left lateral position now why i say rest and monitor because a number of things are done people give iv fluids to increase amniotic fluid people give amniotic uh, this uh, amino acids sachets all of these things are practiced but none of them has a sound uh, none of them has been tested or confirmed to be effective in randomized controls trials so there's not evidence based medicine what can work because see the placenta is the spinal arteries are narrow there is utero placental insufficiency there is right so the only thing that probably works is resting in left lateral position where the placental blood flow increases in this position so that is one thing that we do and the second important thing that we do is monitoring you have to track for fetal growth to tracking for fetal growth we'll have to do an ultrasound for biometry ultrasound for fetal biometry that means measuring the uh, abdominal circumference measuring the femur length measuring the head circumference measuring the bipyramidal diameter so all these parameters that is called as fetal biometry that has to be repeated every 3 to 4 weeks so that has to be done and i'll keep doing the doppler also i'll keep doing the weekly umbilical artery doppler so that i am able to uh, pick up the abnormal umbilical artery doppler findings earlier and the next thing that i'm going to go for is daily fetal monitoring now if a woman is already 32 weeks and i have to do daily fetal monitoring i'll preferably admit this woman i'll preferably admit this woman so that i can go for daily fetal monitoring now what can i do for this daily fetal monitoring i can do daily ctg i can do daily one time ctg cardio tocography Uh, which we call as nst when we are the woman is not in labor so non stress test so we discuss the principles of ctg when we were talking about intrapartum fetal monitoring daily ctg nst that can be done so for this the patient has to be in the ward right and uh, simran you are saying corticosteroids we will give in mature lungs then we will also deliver for preterm can we do very good question we will do that when i'm deciding to deliver let's say for example talking about timing of delivery as long as the fetus is growing there is some forward growth i'm tracking the growth isn't it i told you that i'm tracking the growth i'm doing weekly umbilical doppler artery doppler i'm doing daily fetal monitoring as long as the fetus is growing the umbilical artery doppler remains normal the fetal monitoring results are all normal i can keep continuing the pregnancy and i'll deliver after 38 weeks deliver after 38 weeks are completed i'll take it as far as possible okay delivering after 38 weeks is fine but if there is absent end diastolic flow on umbilical i was doing a doppler weekly isn't it if there is absent umbilical artery absent end diastolic flow on umbilical artery and she is more than 34 weeks more than or equal to 34 completed weeks i will deliver i will deliver a 34 weeks lung maturity has been achieved if she is less than 34 weeks with absent umbilical artery doppler i'll start her on steroids i'll start her on steroids and i will intensify the monitoring i will intensify the fetal monitoring like instead of doing daily nst i could do nst three times a day right so i'll intensify the fetal monitoring i'll keep her admitted the goal is to at least cover the 48 hour period of steroids you know start giving steroids like dexamethasone when we give for pulmonary lung maturity for pulmonary lung maturity the full course that we give takes 40 hours 48 hours so my goal is to at least wait 48 hours at least 48 hours 
I can buy so that these steroids have got time to act. In the meanwhile, I'll intensify the fetal monitoring. If at all the fetal monitoring shows non-reactive uh, CTG, bad CTG findings, then I'll deliver immediately and stop the conservative management. But if it's absent and diastolic flow in less than 34 weeks, I should, you know, at least give her steroid cover. And then depending upon the fetal monitoring results, I can deliver or terminate the pregnancy anytime it becomes abnormal. I mean, I can also go for a daily Doppler. I can also go for a daily or a twice, uh, twice daily uh, Doppler. Okay. And what if there is a reversed end diastolic flow on umbilical artery Doppler? Then what do we do? Now, this reversed is very bad. This reversed is very bad. And then what is recommended is to deliver irrespective of period of gestation. Irrespective of period of gestation, one should be looking for delivery, right? So that means, for example, if she is 32 weeks, if she is 32 weeks, reversed and diastolic flow and, uh, on Doppler, you know, I can will start the steroids, I will at least start the steroids and I will plan for delivery at the same time. I'll plan for delivery at the same time without waiting for 48 hours or something. So I intensify my monitoring, right? Start the steroids and plan for delivery at the same time. So irrespective of period of gestation, one should deliver. The problem is when you find reversed and diastolic flow of Doppler and she's far away from pulmonary maturity, like finding a reversed and diastolic flow at 28 weeks, 27 weeks, 29 weeks. Now, then that patient has a, that pregnancy has a long way to go till 34 weeks. So those become problem situations. Then we can do or intensify the Doppler findings. We can check for the uh, umbilic ductus venosus Doppler or umbilical vein Doppler also they are also they also can be checked but yes once it is reversed and diastolic flow you simply deliver irrespective of period of gestation right so this is your management of growth restricted baby so now I'll take up a question about from Peter here if we identify persistent uterine artery Doppler notching at or beyond 22 weeks it may be a predictor of IUGR in that pregnancy or preeclampsia is there anything that can be done to avert it uh, unfortunately there is nothing that can be done to avert it completely but what can be done in such situations is aspirin prophylaxis Okay, what can be done in such situations is aspirin prophylaxis with the hope that she doesn't develop these complications. Okay, but you cannot, you can, and you ha you'll have to uh, call her up for more frequent uh, OPD uh, visits uh, and keep in mind that uh, sh she's not lost to follow up at a later point in time subsequently in gestation. So these two things you can do. But you can't change the uh, Doppler findings. However, you see that when you identify persistent uterine artery Doppler notching, the sensitivity specificity is not too high. You see, I mean, there are chances, but there's so many cases where there are there is uterine artery Doppler notching and nothing bad happens. You see, so it's it's not a very specific test for that matter. Now, finally, finally. How does the Doppler finding determine the obstetric outcome? Okay, let's go on and talk about the last aspect of this discussion for today. Now, let's say, for example, you had a baby with IUGR and you happen to follow that pregnancy throughout and you identified IUGR, let's say here at 28 weeks. Then you were following, weekly you were doing and everything and you took it up till 32, you took it up till 36, took it up till 37 also. So there was some growth, yes, forward growth was happening and everything and the umbilical artery Doppler remained normal, okay, umbilical artery Doppler remained normal and then you delivered her here at 38 weeks. This is where you delivered her, you said, Bhot ho gaya, I'll deliver and there was another case 
where you identified an IUGR pregnancy here, again at 28 weeks, let's say for that matter, and you were following up that patient and you realized that there is slowing and lagging of growth and the umbilical artery Doppler becomes abnormal and you would see that the weight is much less here and you happen to deliver her at 34 weeks. So two cases of IUGR babies, IUGR baby number one, IUGR baby number two. Both patients you identified as IUGR at 28 weeks. One patient you were able to take up till 20, 38 weeks. The other patient, other fetus you were able to take up to only 34 weeks. With 38 week fetus you were able to achieve some good weight 2.5 kg approximately 2.5 to 3 whatever and with 34 kg you were able to give only 1800 grams weight not much okay which of these two babies fetus number one fetus number two is going to fare better after delivery which of these two babies is going to fare better after delivery if you were to see these two babies which of these two babies is going to fare better after delivery over the next two years, over the next two years of life after being born? Baby number one or baby number two? Yes, guys, baby number one or baby number two? Which of these babies is going to fare better? Very good, Simran. Very good. Baby number one. I shall say baby number one. Very good. So when they ask you your question, when they ask you this question in exams, that long term neurodevelopment outcome in an IUGR newborn depends on what? It depends upon gestational age at delivery. At which gestational age did they deliver? And what was their birth weight? What was their birth weight at that time of delivery? So long-term neurodevelopmental outcome in an IUGR newborn depends on gestational age at delivery and birth weight. Okay. Now I'll give you another example. I will give you another example. Now let's say for example, there were two fetuses. There were two fetuses. Both of those fetuses you were delivering at 32 weeks. At 32 weeks. Both of them. Okay. So fetus number one here and weight was let's say 1200 grams. 1200 grams. So both fetuses you were delivering at 32 weeks. Both fetuses were 1200 gram. Fetus one you delivered with reversed end diastolic flow. And fetus number two, you delivered with absent end diastolic flow. Which fetus has a better outcome? Which fetus has a better outcome? Fetus number one, fetus two, better outcome. Which fetus will have a better outcome? Fetus number one, fetus number two. Yes. Now. The gestational age, the birth weights are all same, but if you were delivering them here, one with uh, fetus number one, because fetus number one had reversed and fetus number two had absent end diastolic flow, better outcome with absent end diastolic flow. Very good. So now you understand that more deranged the Doppler is, worse is the obstetric outcome. There are chances that this fetus with reversed end diastolic flow, this one here, when you subject them to labor, there will be more chances of fetal distress in labor. There will be more chances of meconium passage in labor. More chances of IUD during labor. So the obstetric outcome depends upon the Doppler findings. Right? So very, very important point to note here. That Peter, Peter was asking me, what is the mode of delivery? Is cesarean preferred? Cesarean is often preferred for women with reversed end diastolic flow. If I'm doing a delivery in an IUGR fetus with reversed end diastolic flow, many prefer a direct cesarean section. 
for this very reason for this very reason so if they ask you this mcq that poor obstetric outcome depends on what poor obstetric outcomes in an iugr fetus depends on abnormal umbilical artery doppler and if the estimated fetal weight is less than the third percentile very severe iugr if you are delivering a iugr fetus with reversed and diastolic flow also with an estimated fetal weight which is less than the third percentile that is going to give a very poor obstetric outcome so many prefer to go for a direct cesarean section in cases of delivery of reversed and diastolic flow fetuses okay now is us in how much time absent and reverse diastolic flow you will have to deliver so okay so how much time absent and reversed and diastolic flow you will have to deliver so if there is an absent and diastolic flow and you are going ahead with induction of labor you will apply the same principles of labor progress like you apply to the uh, to the normal progress of labor as well right but you will be very cautious regarding the possibility of fetal distress and abnormal fetal heart rate tracings you will put them under continuous cardiotocography monitoring and if any abnormality arises if any fetal distress takes place then you will immediately do a cesarean section so there is no time limit if you were to ask me that you know we are we are doing this we are have started uh, an absent and diastolic flow case she is less than 34 weeks i have started on steroids i have intensified the fetal monitoring how long can i wait i mean this absent can turn to reverse and diastolic flow in a day in two days in a week we cannot predict we cannot predict all we can do is intensify the fetal monitoring go for a daily doppler and stop the conservative management uh, before it becomes too late okay or before or stop the conservative management once the reversed and diastolic flow appears that's why she has to be kept in the ward and admitted under surveillance right and the goal is the goal is very conservative also i mean if i'm even waiting with absent and diastolic flow i'm always in the mind that i can at least by 48 hours for the steroid cover to get completed okay and how to monitor for iugr the entire monitoring we discussed once you diagnosed iugr you have to track the fetal growth is as you have to track the fetal growth fetal ultrasound biometry every 3 to 4 weeks you have to go for weekly umbilical artery doppler to identify any abnormal doppler findings and you have to go for daily fetal monitoring right if she has severe if she has severe iugr if she is beyond 32 weeks i would like to keep her admitted in the ward for daily fetal monitoring right so that will depend all right now if you are going for daily fetal monitoring what kind of fetal monitoring are you going to do you are going to perform various tests which are there for antenatal fetal monitoring antepartum fetal monitoring like for example we can do the non stress test we can do a non stress test non stress test in the non stress test i discussed it in the previous session when we were talking about intrapartum fetal monitoring i did talked about ctg cardio tocography in the non stress test you use the same ctg principles except for the fact that there is no stress no stress meaning woman is not in labor there are no contractions all that you are tracing is the fetal heart rate pattern and in that fetal heart rate pattern you are looking for the baseline fetal heart rate you're looking for the beat to beat variability you're looking for the presence of accelerations right and if two accelerations are present in 20 minute period you call it a reactive trace a reassuring finding so you utilize the same principles and there should be no spontaneous deceleration there should be no spontaneous drops in fetal heart rate so that is what you do nst and you can also do nst plus afi together which is called as the modified biophysical profile so i can check for the nst for 20 minutes right non stress test done for for 20 20 minutes with the ctg machine plus i can do afi at the same time this is called as modified biophysical profile 
right that will be done so while checking for the amniotic fluid index i am checking the amount of amniotic fluid that is present inside so i will keep a track of if the amniotic fluid is becoming too low so such kind of monitoring techniques are used and uh, Simran fetal pulse rate and movement in NST. NST is that there are two accelerations in 20 minute CTG trace. That would make it a non-stress test reactive. That would make it a reactive NST. It is on the same principles. I mean, you people get confused if NST is a separate test. No, it is not a separate test. It is done on the same CTG machine. The woman is lying down. The cardiotoco probe is applied. And we check the CTG strip. It is called as non-stress test because simply because she you are not doing it in labor. When you do it in labor, it becomes continuous cardiotocography monitoring. When you do that same thing and the woman is not in labor, you can use the same principles, the same CTG machine, the same strip of paper to analyze the fetal well-being in the antepartum period. Okay. Now, Agyani, why is it necessary to give steroids for the baby? It is necessary to give steroids for the baby if the baby is less than 34 weeks because for pulmonary lung maturity, right? Full pulmonary lung maturity is always achieved at term. But we say that yes, beyond 34 weeks, pulmonary maturity is there. So to promote pulmonary lung maturity in the fetus, we have to give steroids when we are delivering a preterm baby. Preterm, how preterm? Less than 34 weeks. Now less than 34 weeks are the guidelines which are given by the American guidelines, ACOG. If you look at the Royal College guidelines, they say that they want to give steroids till 35 weeks plus 6 days. So it can vary from country to country from different guidelines but what we practice here is less than 34 weeks because of the fact that she's less than 34 weeks her pulmonary lung maturity is not expected to be there so you have to start her on steroids right now if you will not give then if you will not give steroids here, is that what you're trying to ask me? What if you don't give steroids at less than 34 weeks? Then you will deliver a baby with a possibility of delivering a baby with less than expected pulmonary lung maturity. Then after delivery, when the baby is going to cry and when the baby is going to breathe in air, the lung alveoli of that baby are not going to get inflated. They're going to get collapsed. Because the more preterm the baby is, the less is the surfactant in the lungs. I mean, your and my lungs, we can breathe and our alveoli get inflated with air because we have a lot of surfactant there that keeps our alveoli open and it prevents them from collapsing. A preterm baby, no surfactant, all right, their alveoli are going to collapse. So, how will the baby breathe? So you've delivered a preterm baby with not enough lung maturity, you've not taken the care to give steroids, then that can happen after delivery. Respiratory distress syndrome can happen to the baby if you don't give steroids for preterm babies. Okay. Aisha, in CTG, we see deceleration with contraction. In NST, no contraction. So, in NST, no contraction. So, you can get uh, spontaneous deceleration without contractions. Right? There can be spontaneous decelerations without contractions. I mean, what was the causing the contract? What was causing the late deceleration? Hypoxia. Utero-placental insufficiency. In the setting of labor, uterine contractions ke saath utero-placental insufficiency hoti thi. If there is a spontaneous deceleration, abhi to contraction bhi nahi hai, even then decelerations are coming. Then that is problematic. That is suggestive of utero-placental insufficiency and possibly fetal hypoxia. If there can, if there is oligohydroamnios here, in cases of IUGI pregnancy, so if there is oligohydroamnios, there can be cord compression, then you can get variable decelerations there. Those decelerations which are like this, sharply declining, right? 
so you can get de repeated decelerations there also even without contraction that is more dangerous that is more dangerous isn't it you can get those same that is why i emphasized on what is the reason behind those deceleration because these reasons can exist even outside of labor isn't it aisha And lastly, uh, Agyani, what's the procedure to give steroids? You give injection dexamethasone, 6 milligrams intramuscularly, 12 hours apart for 4 dosages. This is given to the mother. Okay. So, all right, guys, this is the session. If there are further questions, you can feel free to ask me. Otherwise, I am at the end of the session now. And uh, this is all there is to monitoring the IUGR pregnancies. For NEET PG examinations, you have to have your basics clear. You need to know about the different uh, types of asymmetrical and symmetrical IUGR know those differences then you have to understand the difference between a constitutionally small fetus and an IUGR fetus how you're going to diagnose how is ultrasound helpful in diagnosis what is uteroplacental insufficiency and what are its causes and what does it affect how does it affect the basics about Doppler they do ask you clinical based questions on this is the Doppler finding this is IUGR what is the what is the next treatment going to be are you going to deliver are you going to wait and watch so such kind of questions are famed around this so you should definitely know about absent and reversed end diastolic flow and yes they have also asked question on what are the pre-terminal Doppler changes so keep that in mind right and other than that, the whole principle about monitoring IUGR pregnancy is monitoring and tracking for fetal growth and early detection of umbilical artery Doppler abnormalities. And that is why we'll be doing weekly Dopplers. Okay, so this is about IUGR pregnancies. I am again emphasizing you people always get confused what is NST, what is CTG. It is the same strip. It is the same machine done on the same machine. And when we say reactive NST, that means there are two accelerations in 10, 20 minute period. Two accelerations are there the same way accelerations that I had explained to you in CTG trace. All those same parameters are tested okay it is just a way to denote it okay non-stress test meaning when you are doing that ctg on that patient she's at that time not in labor that's non-stress test and two accelerations in 20 minutes is a reactive nst right but then there should be you have to check the baseline also you have to check the beat to beat variability also so principles remain the same okay So thank you guys so much. You can subscribe to the plus courses and uh, once you subscribe, you will get access to the capsule courses also. And uh, tomorrow's session on YouTube, tomorrow's session for time, same time, 4 p.m. on YouTube, I will be taking up a case scenario on cervical incompetence. Cervical incompetence, cervical insufficiency. That is going to be the discussion for tomorrow in a case-based approach. So thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care.